My name is Darcy Berner. I'm the Executive Director of ProgressiveCongress.org, a, a nonprofit that works with the Congressional Progressive Caucus and progresses inside and outside of Congress. We have a terrific panel today uh, to talk about what's actually going on in Afghanistan and what the alternatives are for the American people. Uh, we'll do a little bit of background so that you have a sense of what's going on, and then we will, in fact, open it up for questions and answers in a bit. So um, why don't we start, uh, I'll introduce the members of our panel. Um, so Matt Duss is the security editor at Think Progress. Uh, retired Major General Paul Eaton is a former commanding general in Iraq uh, and a longtime member of the United States military. Um, Matthew Ho served in Afghanistan in both the military and with the State Department. Uh, and then uh, former Congressman Tom Andrews uh, is currently running the Win Without War Coalition in Washington, D.C. So, uh, why don't we start with some basics. I don't know how familiar many of you are with Afghanistan. Uh, the odds are based on some of the conversations I've had that a few of you have been there. Uh, and there are probably also some people in the room who couldn't name uh, any of the adjoining countries. So, a wide variety of knowledge, I would guess. Um, Mr. Ho, if you'd be so kind, could you talk a little bit about the sort of history and geography and economy of Afghanistan, just a tiny bit, so people get a sense of what we're talking about? Sure. Well, thanks, and uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, Afghanistan is located uh, in Central Asia, uh, between Iran and Pakistan, and Central Asian states. Uh, so its its location is of somewhat strategic importance to the United States. Um, it's uh, the terrain there is varied. You have you, mountains, forests. Uh, you have uh, vast deserts. Uh, the most important thing to understand about it is uh, the population of peoples there. Uh, it's a very divided population. Uh, the, the population is divided among various ethnic groups. Uh, it's divided uh, regionally. Uh, it's divided uh, between urban and rural. You see almost like this red state, blue state phenomenon there. Uh, clash between the uh, progressive and traditional, secular and religious, if you will. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, what I hesitate to say is intertribal, because the tribal system really does not exist any longer in Afghanistan. After 35 years of constant war, it's been uh, decimated. Um, so there, there's inter-tribal, inner inter-village, inner inter-family, inter-clan. Um, and on top of this, you have an incredibly poor country, uh, the poorest that any of us who've, who've been there has ever, have ever seen. Um, and you've pumped uh, 50 or $60 billion in development aid into, uh, which has just you know really exacerbated the situation rather than improving it uh, because of the flood of money. Um, the one thing to take away is, is the, the, the human capacity of that. Uh, particularly compared to other parts of the world. It's near, it, near non-existent. Um, the areas I operated in, the rural areas, uh, you have a male literacy of less than 10%, the female literacy of less than 1%. Uh, the bigger problem is innumeracy, people who can't count, which happened, which you find quite a lot. Uh, you find a, uh, uh, after nine years of our involvement, uh, there, the life expectancy is only still only 43 or 44 years of age. Uh, men take additional wives, if they, if they can afford to, they take additional wives, not just because of the tradition, but because it's a practical thing to do, because there's a very, very good chance, like a one in four chance, that your wife is going to die in childbirth. And on top of this, you have a society where uh, one out of four, one out of five children don't make it to their fifth birthdays. So that, that's kind of like, that gives you a, somewhat of a background, hopefully, in terms of, of what when you talk about nation building, when you talk about doing uh, 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 combat or operations or reconstruction or however you want to describe our, our activity in Afghanistan, that gives you kind of a little bit of background of, of what you're dealing with. Um, so can you talk a little bit uh, about your uh, experience in Afghanistan? You've been there a couple of times, or sorry, multiple times. Uh, well, been there once. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, what that was like and what led to your decision to leave? Of course, uh, but I actually lived in Iraq twice uh, and worked on Iraq and Afghanistan issues in, in, in Washington, D.C. for the Department of State or for the uh, Department of Defense since 02, since basically. Um, I, I got to Iraq, I'm sorry, Afghanistan in, in uh, uh, April of last year. I was a political officer for the State Department. Um, my first assignment was eastern Afghanistan in Jalalabad. Uh, we were in an area of uh, uh, on the uh, uh, Pakistan Afghanistan border. Um, I came to find uh, uh, that what our narrative for us being there, what our purposes for us being there, was not matching up with the realities I saw on the ground. Uh, I came to understand to be a 35-year-old civil war uh, uh, that we were engaged 
engaged in, uh, that the enemy were fighting, the, the, the guys that are our young men were, were fighting and killing every day and, and, and dying as a, as a result, um, were members of the Taliban, not because of some ideological uh, a, a, a belief or some ideological cause, but because they were resisting foreign occupation, they were resisting a corrupt and unrepresentative government, and uh, they were continuing on in, a, again, a 35 year civil war. Uh, I was moved down to the south where I worked daily with an Afghan governor down there, and uh, again, the same type of things uh, I saw as being true in the east, I saw being true in the south. Uh, and it reminded me so much of uh, our involvement in Iraq, uh, particularly 03 to 06 or 07, where we did not. Uh, it, my, my first position in Iraq, I was with the State, the State Department Reconstruction Governance Team. And to give you an example, we were told, you know, so 04 05, the guidance from the embassy was you will not work with the tribal leaders, you will not work with the tribal chiefs, you will work through this new central government system that we have in place. Regardless of the fact that Saddam actually worked quite a bit for the tribal leadership there because that's how he maintained his power and manipulated the population. You will not work through them. You can patronize them, you can condescend to them, you can give them a Quran as a gift, or you can go to their meetings, but you will not work through them. And we didn't fix that. We didn't realize the error of that until really late 06 and 07. Um, and so I saw some of the same things in Afghanistan, refusing to realize uh, the reality of the situation we were in, and refusing to do those steps necessary to alleviate uh, uh, the situation, particularly addressing the Taliban as one monolithic terrorist group, when in reality it's, it's a, a very broad uh, multitude of, uh, of different local groups that have, many of them have legitimate political grievances that can be addressed, just like we found in the insurgency in Iraq. So after being involved with this for however many years, really since 02, um, I, I, as a matter of conscience, that I had no longer take part in this, that this is how my leadership is going to uh, conduct this war. Uh, and so I, I